Win real prizes playing Your Brain on Facts Weekly Trivia Contest. Games run Friday to the following Thursday, and this week's prizes are gift cards donated by Deepwater Gaming. Tell your friends and flex your mental muscle. There are multiple winners each week. Play now at yourbrainonfacts.com slash trivia. A friend asks you out to a nice dinner. The evening's been swell, then the check comes. Your friend whistles an idle tune, stares blankly into the distance, does anything other than reach for the check. Finally, you give in and pay, just like last time. This is especially infuriating because your friend used to be the King of England. My name's Moxie, and this is your Brain on Facts. Saving money is of peaked importance these days, but even a good thing taken too far can be a bad thing. Have you seen the show Extreme Cheapskates? I can't say I endorse the idea of making a bed out of packing peanuts or sharing a single Q-tip with my spouse just to save some money. But some of the most extreme cheapskates of all time didn't need to worry about regular saving, let alone eating exclusively from restaurant dumpsters by choice levels of savings. These serious skin flints, these marvelous misers, were all fabulously wealthy. John Elways was born into prosperity in Britain in 1714, living on a large country estate with the equivalent of millions in the bank. Elway's early life was one of creature comforts, the best schools, society functions, and vacations to the continent, but he managed to turn that all around. In fairness, he had help. His mother, perhaps wanting to ensure that her late husband's fortune lasted as long as possible, died of starvation rather than spend money on food. Elway's comfortable lifestyle ended when he met his maternal uncle Harvey. Harvey Elways was a notorious miser who prided himself on spending a mere 110 pounds a year on his upkeep, which I can tell you equates to $138, but it's hard to adjust for inflation when you're talking about 300 years ago. Suffice it to say, that is not a lot of money spread across an entire year. John began to play up his own stinginess to impress his Uncle Harvey. The two would spend evenings complaining about other people's spending while sharing a single glass of wine. When Harvey died, John inherited his fortune and his nature. Elways was now richer and more cheap. Though he would become the Member of Parliament for wealthy Berkshire County, Elways only became more eccentrically penny-pinching. He rode a scrawny old horse to London to perform his official duties, taking a long and circuitous route to avoid tolls. He lived in uninhabited homes like a squatter, refusing to put any money into the upkeep of the buildings. His own homes, at least, homes on his properties. To save on candles, Elways went to bed precisely at sundown. His wig, a must for gentlemen of the day, he found in a hedge. Elways would wear the same suit for months at a time, day and night. His clothes would be worn to absolute tatters, People passing him on the street assumed he was a beggar and gave him change. An actual down-on-his-luck, living-rough person might spend that money on food. Not Elway's. He ate meat so maggoty, it is reported by one biographer, that it walked about his plate. And once, Elway's even robbed a rat of a dead duck that it had found in a river. Again, this was a member of parliament, comparable to a U.S. senator. In the end, it was his cost-saving eating habits that did him in, leaving him sick and malnourished. The doctor who attended his deathbed said that Elways would have lived at least 20 years longer if he had just spent a little money taking care of himself. His net worth at the time of his death? The modern equivalent of nearly one billion pounds, which went to two illegitimate sons. 18th century Britain must have been a good scene for misers because it generated a fair few. Over in Harrow, northwest of London, Daniel Dancer inherited his family fortune in 1736, which could easily have provided 20-year-old Dancer and his sister a comfortable life. Instead, they chose to live like peasants, and not in a good staying humble and not losing touch with the common man sort of way. I'll speak mostly to Daniel's habits, but you can assume that those things apply to his sister, too. A sister whose name I could not find even in books that still used curvy lowercase f's instead of s's. 
even they didn't bother listing the fifter's name. These days, Harrow is part of Greater London and sits only a few miles from Wembley Stadium. But back then, the area was all farms, which is how the Dancer family had built their wealth. Until Daniel, who left the fields unplowed to save the expense of men and equipment to, you know, farm. The lack of agriculture can't be blamed for their diet, however. Once a week, the sister would cook them a meal of hard dumplings and cooked bones or meat. Where did they get the meat? I'm glad you asked, though you might not be in a second. Wherever Daniel found it. Be it the carcass of a sheep that had died at the edge of the property some days prior, or a bone that was already being chewed on by a dog. That protein and the dumplings would then be parceled out to be eaten once daily for the next six days, only to repeat the process again next week. Soap was too precious a commodity for the dancers, so Daniel would bathe in a nearby creek, scrubbing himself with wet sand and drying in the sun. He would adorn his reasonably clean all-things-considered body with the most shameful, raggedy, befouled excuse for clothing that you can imagine. Daniel wore each item of clothing for weeks or months at a time, until it wore clean through. He would then put another piece of clothing or loose scrap of fabric haphazardly over the hole. Did he sew these patches on? No. He tied them onto himself. And he didn't use twine or yarn, because those things cost money too. He would tie his layers on with handfuls of hay that was still growing on the property, though I can't pretend to know how. To the surprise of no one, the dancers were recluses, not that people were falling over themselves to visit. They really only had two visitors. Their neighbors, Lady Tempest and her brother Captain Holmes. They brought food to the sister when she was gravely ill and tried to persuade Daniel to send for a doctor. Whether he thought his sister would get better on her own or he consciously valued the doctor's fee more than his sister's life, we can't say for sure, but the outcome was the same. She died, and Daniel, inheriting her portion of the family estate, was now even richer. The only creature Dancer showed any affection toward was his old dog, until a neighbor complained about the dog chasing his sheep, so to avoid being taken to court or having to pay to replace expensive sheep, Dancer had a farrier remove the dog's teeth. On his once-a-year outing to buy a new shirt, the only clothing purchase he'd make, he tried to haggle the owner of a second-hand shop down on the price of a shirt from three shillings to two shillings and sixpence. Here is exactly as much as I know about the old British money system. Pence is plural for penny, and there are 12 pence to the shilling. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Let's scale this up to make it a little bit easier to understand. If the shirt was priced at $3, he only wanted to pay two fifty. Dancer and the shop owner argued and settled in the middle on two shillings and nine pence. When Daniel paid the three shillings, the shop owner refused to give him any change. Furious at being cheated out of three pennies, Dancer took her to court, where, to his horror, she won, and Dancer was ordered to cover those expenses as well, which came to five shillings. One can't help but think that he probably felt that loss more keenly than the loss of his sister. Lady Tempest continued to visit Dancer and tried to sway him on the merits of spending money on food or hiring someone to keep up the house. She did manage to convince him to spend one shilling on a hat to replace the one that he'd worn for 14 years straight. But the next time Lady Tempest saw Dancer, he was back in his old hat, having sold the new one. Still, Dancer must have thought highly of Lady Tempest, because it was to her that he left his fortune when he died at the staggering age of 78. Maybe eating roadkill and not bathing is good for your immune system or something, I don't know. When Lady Tempest died the following year, Everything went to her brother, Captain Holmes. When Holmes had the dancer house cleaned up, the servants found money hidden everywhere. Coins and banknotes were tucked into nooks and crannies, and even hidden in the teapot. Dancer is held up as the real-life inspiration for Ebenezer Scrooge, and I'd say you could make a good case. Decades later, in an ocean away, you might have caught a glimpse of an old woman with a grim face walking down a city street in faded, tattered dress, carrying her lunch of bread crusts in an old bag. Don't pity her. That's Hetty Green, the witch of Wall Street. And at that moment, she is literally the richest woman in the world. Henrietta Robinson was born into a wealthy Massachusetts Quaker family in 1834. 
Her mother's health was often poor, so Hetty's father and grandfather picked up the slack in her upbringing, teaching her to read stock reports when other children were being read fairy tales. By the time she was 13, Hetty had taken over the accounting for her family business. But this was the early Victorian era, so when Hetty was 20, her father bought her a wardrobe full of the finest dresses of the season in order to attract a wealthy suitor. Hetty immediately sold the new dresses and invested the proceeds in government bonds. Having a family was not in Hetty's priorities. You can't put a numerical figure to love, so she had little need of it as she built her fortune. Hetty oversaw tremendous real estate deals, bought and sold entire railroads, and made strategically important loans. She was particularly adept at prospering from the downfall of others, buying failing stocks, foreclosed properties, even holding entire banks at her mercy through her enormous loans. Hetty was a brilliant financial strategist, or a mob kingpin-style loan shark, depending on who you asked. Collis Huntington, the man who built the Central Pacific Railroad, said she was nothing more than a glorified pawnbroker. Sounds a little jealous if you ask me. Hetty was the money-making peer of the likes of Carnegie and Rockefeller, but where they were industrialists, turning money into things that then turn into more money, Green simply turned money into more different money. Her name didn't end up on factories and businesses, so she never had the same acclaim. That's not to say she didn't leave her mark. Hetty was an innovator in the field of value investing, which has made billionaires out of people like Warren Buffett. Now, despite the fact that he lives in a house that he bought for $30,000 decades ago and has been seen using coupons for fast food, Warren Buffett is not going to be on today's list, because he gives prolifically to charity. Same goes for Bill Gates. Hetty's name would also not appear on any endowments or charities. She wasn't about to give away money that she had earned. In fact, when her Aunt Sylvia died and left millions to charity, Hetty was not having it. She challenged the will in court, claiming to have Aunt Sylvia's real will, which left everything to Hetty, naturally, and contained an unusual clause that specifically invalidated any future versions of the will. In a rare defeat for Hetty, The judge declared that the aunt's signature and the clause were forgeries, and the case was thrown out. At age 33, Hetty finally conceded to marry, once she found a suitor who had a fortune of his own. She married Edward Green, with whom she had two children, Ned and Sylvia. Edward had money, but wasn't as good with it as Hetty was with hers. She did what she could to keep their finances separate, but this was almost 50 years before women even got the vote. So, Banks kept treating her money as if it was her husband's. When Hetty finally put a stop to that, Edward moved out. On his own, his finances shortly began to decline, as did his health. Hetty, perhaps not being the villain the male movers and shakers of her time made her out to be, did tend her husband in his final months and wore mourning clothes for years after his death. Aw, she's got a heart of gold for her family. Yeah, no. Ned and Sylvia were at the full mercy of Green's tight purse strings. The family moved frequently as Green found increasingly cheap accommodations for them, often sleeping on cots in unheated apartments. When Ned, whom Green had been grooming to be her successor, had one leg badly injured by a passing cart, Green took him to a free clinic. The doctors recognized Green and demanded payment, since they knew she had more than enough to pay for her son to have the best medical care that science had to offer. Green instead went to Plan B, fixing the leg herself at home, with treatments like oil of squills and Carter's little liver pills. Ned's leg would eventually need to be amputated, which was only done by a doctor because it happened to happen while Hetty and Edward were estranged, and Edward paid for the doctor himself. Hetty wasn't about to waste money on doctors for herself, either. After suffering from a hernia for 20 years, which she'd been dealing with by poking her protruding intestine back through her abdominal wall with a stick, she finally went to a doctor. When he told the woman with the equivalent of millions of dollars in the bank that she needed surgery that would cost $150, she picked up her gut-poking stick from the floor and yelled, You're all alike, a bunch of robbers, and she stormed out. Green died in 1916 at age 81, with an estimated $100 million in liquid assets and much more in land and investment that her name doesn't necessarily appear on, writes Investopedia. 
The family fortune she started with was the equivalent of six million dollars, about 4.5 million pounds. And through financial moves, both prudent and cutthroat, Green's wealth swelled to nearly two billion dollars, or 1.6 billion pounds. That makes it all the more bizarre that she never rented an office for her business affairs. Heated leftovers on the radiator when visiting someone else's office near lunchtime. Instructed her laundress only to wash the dirtiest parts of her dress to save on soap, and allegedly spent the better part of a night scouring her carriage for a two-cent stamp that she had dropped. You know how they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? Well, Green's little apples rolled their way right out of the orchard. Ned went hog wild with his inheritance. He married his first lover, a prostitute his mother hated, and together they spent lavishly. They built mansions, bought a private island, maintained an entourage, even had an enormous yacht built, which never got used because Ned would get too seasick. Ned didn't spend himself into poverty, though. He invested in the newfangled radio technology that was being developed, and had enough of a fortune left at his death to leave to Sylvia. Sylvia defied her mother's spirit by leaving 99% of that fortune to charity, in modern dollars, about $440 million, or 352 million pounds. We have so much to be grateful for in our lives, even now, and I am grateful for a recent review from, I'm going to pronounce this, Architooth, sort of looks like a portmanteau of architect and sleuth, who says, I look forward to each episode. Moxie is great at providing unique information and keeping it interesting. She also seems to genuinely care about her listeners' thoughts, opinions, and perspectives, a fact that I greatly appreciate. I am very glad that you feel that way, Architooth, because that is what I have striv- strove or striven for. It's what I go for, at any rate. If you've never reviewed your brain on facts, Podchaser.com has extended their Reviews for Good charity drive, wherein, where for every review that's left, they donate 25 cents to Meals on Wheels and another 25 cents when the podcaster responds, which you know I'll do. Speaking of valuing my listeners' thoughts, the weekly Your Brain on Facts trivia contest, even though it's still fairly new, is already seeing diminishing participation. This is something I want to provide, obviously, to have fun, a nice little bit of distraction, and to win prizes, which, you know, definitely doesn't suck. The most recent round of prizes was provided to us by Deepwater Gaming, and we thank them for that. So I want to know, what is it that makes the trivia contest less appealing to you? Is putting it over the weekend not good timing? Are the quizzes too long? Are the quizzes too hard? Or were you just not aware of it? If you could pop onto the social media, Facebook and Instagram.com slash YourBrainOnFacts and Twitter at BrainOnFactsPod, and let me know so that I can make the contest something that appeals to you. How did you do on this past week's Mystery Monday? The clues were a man's mugshot wearing a t-shirt that says go directly to jail from Monopoly, a screen cap of the sheet music from the Yes song I've Seen All Good People, and the table flipping meme. The topic was board games. And congratulations again to Maria, who won right at the last moment. Be sure to look on the social media for the clues to Mystery Monday each week. There's nothing new under the sun, and parsimonious penny pinchers aren't just Dickensian caricatures. We've brought them with us into the modern world. To give you a stunning example, please welcome my special guest, Brian, from the podcast, I Have So Many Questions. This is Brian Watson, host of the I Have So Many Questions podcast, and I want to tell you a story about one of the worst cheapskates ever and just an all-around douchebag. His name was J. Paul Getty. Gene Paul Getty, born in 1892, was an American-born British petro-industrialist, founded the Getty Oil Company, and became a really, really rich guy as a result. In 1957, Fortune magazine named him the richest living American while he set the Guinness Book of World Records in 1966 as the world's richest private citizen, worth an estimated $1.2 billion at the time, which is approximately $7.2 billion in 2018. At the time of his death in 1976, he was worth more than $6 billion, which is approximately $21 billion in 2018. Gady spoke Multiple languages, he was fluent in French, German, and Italian, conversational in Spanish, Greek, Arabic, and Russian. 
or a love of the classics led Getty to acquire reading proficiency in ancient Greek and ancient Latin. Getty was a notorious cheapskate, though, and did not hold his family in any kind of regard, really. In 1959, Getty bought Sutton Place, a 72-room mansion purchased from George Sutherland Levison Gower, 5th Duke of Sutherland, for £60,000, or about half of what the Duke paid for it 40 years earlier. Getty had a payphone installed in the mansion for guests and anybody who did not live in the household, which is basically anybody other than him, to use. Getty installed the payphone in the residence, in the mansion, because the people that were there, guests and so forth, and various other people, business acquaintances, were running up his phone bill. This would have been in the 50s and 60s when long distance was a thing. And phone usage was a thing, so he had a payphone installed to cut down on his phone bill in his 72-room mansion. Getty once took a group of friends to a dog show in London. He made the friends walk around the block for 10 minutes until the tickets became half-priced at 5 p.m. because he didn't want to pay the full five shillings per head to go see the dog show. Getty would reuse stationery. He had a habit of writing his responses to letters on the margins or on the backsides of the letters that were sent to them to him mailing them back rather than using a new sheet of paper. He also carefully saved and reused manila envelopes, rubber bands, and other office supplies. But Getty is probably best known for how he handled, in 1973, the kidnapping of his 16-year-old grandson, John Paul Getty III. In Rome, on July 10, 1973, a group of Italian mobsters kidnapped Getty's 16-year-old grandson, and demanded a $17 million ransom, which is the equivalent of $98 million in 2019. The family, however, suspected a ploy by the rebellious teenager, he was 16, to extract money from his miserly grandfather. John Paul Getty Jr., the boy's father, asked his father, the notorious penny pincher, for the money. But Getty refused, arguing that his 13 other grandchildren could also become kidnapped victims if he paid. We jump to November 1973, a full four months after his grandson has been kidnapped. In November 1973, an envelope containing a lock of hair and a human ear arrived at a daily newspaper in Italy. The second demand had been delayed three weeks due to an Italian postal strike. The demand threatened that, that uh, Getty III would be further mutilated unless the victims paid $3.2 million. The demand stated, quote, this is Paul's ear. If we don't get some money within 10 days, then the other ear will arrive. In other words, he will arrive in little bits, unquote. When the kidnappers finally reduced their demands to $3 million, Getty agreed to pay no more than $2.2 million, which is the equivalent of $12.7 million in 2019. The reason Getty would only agree to pay no more than $2.2 million because that, would be, that was the maximum amount that he could claim as a tax deduction. And then to make up the difference to get to the $3 million that the kidnappers were asking for, Getty lent his son the remaining $800,000 at 4% interest. Getty's grandson was found alive on December 15, 1973 in a Loria filling station in the, in the province of Potenza shortly after the ransom was paid. Shortly after his release, the younger Getty called his grandfather to thank him for paying the ransom, but Getty refused to come to the phone. Things did not, however, improve for J. Paul Getty III. The grandson was permanently affected by the trauma of his kidnapping, which lasted for almost six months, and he became a drug addict. After a stroke brought on by a cocktail of drugs and alcohol in 1981, Getty III was rendered speechless, nearly blind, and partially paralyzed for the rest of his life. He would remain this way for another 30 years, dying in 2011 at the age of 54. The miser defended his initial refusal to pay the ransom on two points. He argued that his other 13 grandchildren could also become kidnapped victims if he paid. Getty also said, though, quote, The second reason for my refusal was much broader based. I contend that acceding to the demands of criminals and terrorists merely guarantees the continuing increase and spread of lawlessness, violence, and such outrages as terror bombings, skyjackings, and the slaughter of hostages that plague our present-day world, unquote. Getty was taking a principled stand while sacrificing his grandson's ear and eventually his grandson's life. Getty would die within three years of the kidnapping episode. Getty died on June 6, 1976. Getty was a penny pincher and a miser and a cheapskate. Interestingly enough, though, Getty was married and divorced five times. 
He had five sons with four of his wives. In 2013, at the age of 99, Getty's fifth wife, Louise, published a memoir reporting how Getty had scolded her for spending money too freely in the 1950s on the treatment of their six-year-old son, Timmy. The treatment for Timmy was because he had become blind due to a brain tumor. Timmy died, unfortunately, at the age of 12. Getty, who was living in England at the time, apart from his family, who remained in the United States, and here's the coup de grace. Getty did not attend the funeral for his 12-year-old son. This has been Brian Watson, host of the I Have So Many Questions podcast. Thanks, Brian. On a street in Lareda Heights, California, south of Beverly Hills, sits a single-story stucco house with its roof about to cave in. The blue and black tarps have been on the roof for years, much to the annoyance of the neighbors. They've written letters, researched contractors, even found potential buyers to take the home off the owner's hands. The city sued the owner, citing building inspections from at least three years prior, documenting the rotting roof, which had become home to a beehive. All anyone got was the occasional view of the homeowner up on the roof in his bathrobe and slippers, putting the tarps back in place after the wind blew them around. This whole situation was especially frustrating because the neighbors knew that the man who refused to fix his roof was worth $150 million, or 120 million pounds. The successful financier moving tarps in his bathroom was Ed Wedbush. Frugality was a very necessary part of Wedbush's early life. Born in 1933, his family was doing their best to survive the Great Depression. Being careful with what little money you had could literally be the difference between life and death. And carrying some of those principles through to his adult life would have been advantageous. But Wedbush brought them all. Frugal things like bringing lunch to work and driving an old car are all well and good, but Wedbush took saving to an extreme. He and a high school friend founded the mutual fund brokerage Wedbush & Company in 1955. It was named for Wedbush because neither man wanted his name on the business if it failed, and Wedbush lost the coin toss. The firm later branched into investment banking, helping small companies go public, and got in on the ground floor of processing computerized stock trades. The firm was making stacks, but Wedbush was obsessed with controlling costs. Not just limiting costs, controlling them. No company credit cards were ever given to any employee. All checks for expense reimbursement were signed by Wedbush personally, to remind everyone that he was watching every dime they spent on travel or entertaining clients. Wedbush, the CEO of a multi-million dollar company, could be seen gathering up loose paper clips after a board meeting at the exclusive, posh, and, since there are no prices for anything on the website, I'm going to assume obscenely expensive, California Club. The firm's former chief financial officer of 15 years, Peter Allman Ward, said of Wedbush's saving, that's his consuming passion. He probably gets more fun controlling costs than anything. The same fun could not be said of his employees. While the outside of the corporate headquarters is immaculate and sharp and black and gray, the inside tells the real story of Wedbush's scrimping. The carpets are worn through with years of foot traffic and dotted with coffee stains. The floor in the trading room is in such bad shape in places that women wearing heels find themselves stuck in holes. Wedbush's solution? Duct tape. He had them slap some duct tape over the holes and went about his day. No expense was safe from Wedbush's monetary machete. The monthly pizza party to keep up morale during the 2018 financial crisis? Gone. Even though the firm was doing just fine. For the annual holiday party, Wedbush declared that he would pay for the meat and nothing else. He ended up in court after doing things like taking back an employee's company stock and docking stockbrokers to pay for the cost of arbitration the company might end up in. Wedwish argued that his thrift translated into greater job security. If I was real popular on the carpet and the pizzas and all these other things, and the company was on the threshold of closing, they'd want to shoot me at dawn because they want their jobs. See also False Dichotomy. And that's where we run out of ideas, at least for today. 
King Edward VIII famously gave up the British throne to marry his twice-divorced American girlfriend, but he didn't give up much else. Even as Duke of Windsor, his personal fortune was between 100 and 200 million in modern terms, depending on who's counting. Even so, he'd sit at a restaurant table and simply outlast his companions, who'd give in and pay if they wanted to get on with the rest of their lives. The Duke and Duchess traveled the world, but were able to book a three-room suite, one for him, one for her, and one for their pugs, at a huge discount by holding a shipboard press conference at the end of the voyage and occasionally showing up at bingo. Remember, you can always find the script and the source material for the show at yourbrainonfacts.com. Thanks for spending part of your day with me, and stay safe. And if you've learned nothing else from today's talk, it is that trickle-down economics is a bullshit theory.